Everyone, welcome. Uh, let me just say, this is not my first time uh, teaching a class in Africa. It's not my first time uh, giving a lecture in Kenya. It is my first time ever giving a lecture in my socks. So uh, it's a very special occasion. I, I thank you for sharing it with me. Uh, I'm grateful for it. Uh, this is me uh, and the organization that I represent, which is uh, Center for Civic Media, which is part of MIT's Media Lab. MIT is Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and it's one of the better technology schools in the US. The Media Lab is where they put all the crazy people, basically. Uh, and I mean that sort of literally. When you walk around in our building, the guy in the lab next to me is trying to figure out how to make an opera that stars robots. Uh, but not all of it is, is sort of silly. Some of it is very serious. The guy below me is trying to make better artificial limbs. So all of these people are together in a building thinking about sort of what's the future of technology. And the group that I'm with is really interested in this question, how is news changing and how is it different as we get into a digital age? So we spend a lot of time thinking about this, but one of the ways I like to introduce my students to the question is actually to show somebody else's video. So this is a two minute commercial from The Guardian, and I wanna show it to you, and then I actually wanna spend some time picking it apart, because I think in many ways this video is a really interesting vision of where we're going in digital media. and pretty controversial video for people who work on the future of journalism. So just on the surface of this, this is probably the UK's most serious newspaper, uh, one of the very best newspapers in the world today, uh, and they're telling us a children's story. Uh, but they're telling us a children's story because they want us to look at this to think about how news might be different now than it was even 10 years ago. And so I want to pull apart some parts of this video to sort of think about what The Guardian is telling us is sort of the direction of where we're going with news. One of the things you may notice that at the end of it is that that last slide uh, shows the different ways The Guardian wants to deliver information to you. So they've got print, they've got phone, they've got tablet, they've got internet. And so they're looking at this and essentially saying, this is basically the main thing they're announcing in this video. We're going to be native to all of these formats. You don't have to wait for the paper to come out. We might be giving you something real time on your phone. We might be delivering it on your tablet. But the truth is, there's actually something much bigger going on here, which is that all these different media are merging to one extent or another. 
whether the media thinks of itself as FM radio, whether it thinks of itself as broadcast TV, satellite TV, whether it thinks of itself as cable TV, to a large extent, everyone is moving to this new paradigm that people are calling digital first. And the idea behind this is, is this. In a pre-digital world, we would wait for the print edition to come out. And everything else waited on that. So we would get everything done for a print edition, we would put it to press, and when it was out on the street, then we would put those stories up on the web. And the world has changed completely since then. What's happening now is that the same story might end up on radio, it might end up on television, it might end up on print, but it's probably going to come first to the web and possibly even first to your phone. And what this is doing is it's actually changing the entire pace of journalism. There was a very, very good study done recently by a guy named Pablo Boscovitz who looked at two major papers in Argentina and figured out that what was happening to these papers, because they're both going web first, is that they're trying to beat each other. And so they're looking for any little bit of news and they're trying to jump on it very quickly. And one of the things that's interesting with this video is this video is very fast, right? It's clip, 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 clip. This is the pace that many of us have had to adjust to as we start adjusting to a digital world. Now let me say, just despite the fact that digital is rising, it's actually a much more complicated picture depending on where you are. So this is in the US. Uh, and this is atypical, but this is what's going on in the US. And when people talk about how news is changing, this is a graph of where people have been getting their news going from 1991 through 2010. So at the very top here, you can see TV news is still the most important thing by far in the United States. It's not the web, it's not newspaper, it's still television. And actually it's local television news that's still incredibly powerful. And I would suspect that if you look at Kenya, TV news and radio news end up being incredibly powerful. But you can see that's decreasing. It's down from 68% of people, down to 58% of people. It's a decrease, it's not that sharp a decrease. Where the sharp decreases really show up in the US are from read a newspaper, which was 56% of people 20 years ago, which is down to 31% of people now. And that 31% of people who are saying they're reading a newspaper, they are older people. Uh, simply put, it's not what young people are doing. What young people are doing in the US is this. They started asking the question, did you get news online in 2004? And that's gone up sharply to 34%, more than are now reading newspapers in the US at this point. Now, like I said, this isn't universal. There's different dynamics going on in different places. India right now is going through a resurgency in the newspaper business. And the reason for this is that so many more Indians are learning how to read. And so there's an enormous population demanding newspapers every single day. This is actually a terrific time to be running a paper newspaper in India. Uh, just across the border, over in Addis, newspapers are so scarce that there's actually a rental business based around it. So rather than going ahead and buying it, there are people who have bought the day's paper who will rent it to you so you can top yourself up with news and then pass it on to the next guy, literally watching with a watch to make sure you get there. So my point on this is not that print is dead. It's not true. Print is still very vibrant. It's still incredibly important. It's a way we reach a lot of audiences. But print is one of the slower parts of our cycle. We are now, in many cases, building news that's probably first going to go out on something like Twitter, and then might hit the web, and then is going to hit paper at the end of the day. And that model actually was the model that got picked up by a very interesting newspaper in Nigeria called 234 Next, which was one of the more radical and sort of provocative papers. It's currently on hiatus. We're hoping it's going to come back. But it literally started business as a Twitter feed. It then became a website. Over time, it ended up putting out a print edition. And actually, for it, the print edition is probably what killed it off. Had it stuck to the web, it probably would have survived a little bit longer. So the second thing I wanted to make a point about that the video focuses on is the fact that 
the news isn't just being built by the professionals in that video. We go back for a moment. So two things go on in this scene, right? Remember, the pigs boil the wolf alive, they get challenged, but they give the defense that he'd wrecked two of their homes, he was you know, threatening to wreck the third home, they were just defending their home, they were invoking homeowners' rights. But now, two things have happened. First of all, there's now a clip of video. It's surfaced on YouTube. It's probably shot by somebody in a bus. And it's of the big bad wolf, and he's using an asthma inhaler. So we know that he's unlikely to be able to blow the house down because he has serious lung problems. So the Guardian is making the point, this is not that the Guardian went out and found this brilliant piece of reporting to challenge the story. This is suggesting that somebody else reading the story decided to investigate further. And then we have this character, which is the Guardian's caricature of a blogger. You can tell he's a blogger because he's wearing his pajamas, he's alone in his bedroom, and he's a little bit crazy. But this is very much the model that I think some people have for bloggers. I'm, I'm a blogger, I am a little bit crazy. But you see here, he's doing his own private investigation of what's going on on the story. This is really interesting to think about a newspaper starting to take this seriously. Because for a long time, this has been the barrier where newspapers have said, this is what we do, and this is what you do. Newspapers got comfortable with this idea that individuals might be sharing their opinions, right? We might react to a story, we might say, I think this is good, I think this is bad. What newspapers are still really trying to deal with is this question of who gets to investigate and who gets to report. And I think what's interesting about this part of the video is that you have this giant newspaper essentially saying, despite the fact that we have hundreds of staff and editors, we're not able to report everything. And that sometimes the critical details of a story aren't going to come from our reporters, they're going to come from the general public. And this is a very modern and very progressive realization. I don't think most news organizations are quite this far yet. But it's very interesting to see The Guardian sort of announce, this is where we're going. We think the idea that some accounts come from citizens is important. And we want to figure out how we incorporate that into how we build our newsroom. Now here's another aspect of this. It's not just that the newspaper comes out on paper or on the web. It's that in this case, the news is something that starts a discussion. So immediately after this story comes out, The Guardian is then telling us this is the beginning of a conversation. And in fact, they're even telling us where they want to have the conversation. They want to invite us in to have a conversation. They want us to use this hashtag. They want us to add this to the tweets and Twitter so that people can find the conversation. We can have a conversation coming out of our open newsroom where you can react to the story and you can tell us what you're thinking, what you're feeling about this. Now again, if we go back in time, Newspapers have always had letters to the editor. In some papers, they're pretty important and people read them. In many papers, and if anyone has ever worked in an editorial desk, you know that this is where all the crazy people come. And you get these sort of rantings about, you know, this problem in my neighborhood, the newspaper should do something. That's all moved into a much more dynamic conversation. And we ignore that conversation at our peril when we're making news. Because it's an incredibly powerful feedback loop. When we put out a story and we listen to what people are saying after the fact, we have the opportunity to hear what did people understand, what didn't they understand, what do they need more of to understand. We can find out what questions they want to have answers. In many ways, if we find ways to intelligently listen to that conversation, we actually get very good clues on where we might want to push that story going forward. Fourth thing I want to talk about. This is something we almost never talk about in the world of news. But I actually think it's really important, and I find it fascinating that The Guardian decides to put this forward in this, which is this idea of mobilization.
So remember, again in our story, after the three little pigs go to court, uh, we find out that, in fact, they are guilty. They, they did kill off the wolf, but it was because of insurance fraud. They had to knock down their own houses because they couldn't pay the mortgage anymore, because they were broke and they were in debt to the banks. And what this is suggesting is that the Guardian ran that story, reported on what happened to the pigs, reported on how desperate they became that they had to tear down their own houses and kill an innocent wolf. And then people got very upset and they started tweeting and discussing and expressing their anger. And then what the Guardian seems to be suggesting is because of that popular discontent that came from that news story, you end up with protests and riots in the streets to talk about what happens next. This is a really interesting aspect of news that we don't talk about often enough. What are we actually doing when we're making news? Most people, I think, would argue that we're trying to inform people on how they participate in a democratic society. And I think much of the time, we tend to think that what we're trying to do is help people understand their government, make a decision for how they want to vote, and we sort of think, well, you know, every four or five years, we'll do our job, we'll get people ready, that they'll go show up in their constituencies and they'll vote. But that's a really superficial way of thinking about our job. Another way to think about our job is that we are here to give the public the information they need to be civic actors. And so what that means is sometimes, if something is going wrong, we may be in the position where we can tell people, this is something you should be upset about. This is something that you might need to address with your politicians. This is something that we need to talk about as a society. Now this is really difficult. This is really difficult in the Kenyan context as well. We can all remember five years back when the Daily Nation said, we're just going to put unity on the front page. We don't want to accelerate any of this tension that's going on. But it raises this question of what's our job. And to a certain extent, one way to think about what happens in a digital world is that it may be easier to mobilize around an issue than ever before. We've all seen the way that an idea can go around on SMS. We've all seen a way that an idea can go around on Twitter or on Facebook. Part of our responsibility as the press may be to think about how we help people find productive and constructive ways to engage with these issues. It's not a matter of sort of saying, we're upset at the banks, now it's time to have a riot. But it may be a way of saying, we're upset with the banks. Who's responsible for this? Who is the regulator? Who is the government committee? Who's the minister that this is under? And helping our readers understand that civic connection as a piece of this. So when you put all of these things together, what The Guardian seems to be saying is that news is going to be available everywhere. It's not going to be just something you have with your morning tea. It's going to get you all through the day. It's going to show up on your phone. You're probably going to surf on it in your free time. You know, whether that's what you're doing now, this is what's starting to happen. Most people who are working in offices check news six to 10 times a day. It's what people do these days instead of smoking cigarettes. You go, you hit reload, what happened? Did anything change? It's all around you at all time. And it's not going to break once a day. It's going to break every five minutes, every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes. It's quite relentless and how it comes. One of the reasons it's able to come all the time is that it's not just coming from the professionals. It's going to be jointly reported. And the people who are bringing this forward sometimes will be paid to do it, sometimes will be uh, someone who considers themselves a citizen journalist, sometimes will just be someone who's an eyewitness of something. You may see something and you may end up saying something, and that may end up being incredibly important. Right now in northern Mexico, it's an incredibly unsafe situation. The drug violence is so serious that people are literally checking on Twitter before they leave their homes in a city like Monterrey. And so people are simply all getting into the business of saying, I can hear gunshots, I'm on this street, be careful. That's a form of reporting. And that's a form of jointly getting together and reporting on these situations. And we're seeing this happen. That's not any NGO. That's not anyone's formal effort. That's simply neighbors looking out for one another and trying to say, I want to warn you, in the same way that you hear the taxi drivers warn each other about traffic jams. 
all over the place. This form of crowdsourcing isn't very new, but it is something that's actually much, much faster when we start doing it in the digital age. The ability to get that whole mental map of a city and what's safe and what's not safe out of joint reporting comes into play. The third thing that I think we're going to see is that the news is always going to start the conversation. It's not going to be the last word. It's going to be what we read so that we have common ground to have an argument or to have a discussion. And over time, those arguments and discussions end up being part of the news as well. So this is another way that we end up jointly reporting. We end up jointly reporting by asking questions, by discussing, by being part of the public that the news is bringing together. Ultimately, I'm seeing more and more news that is somehow trying to connect to action. And that action isn't always protest. That action isn't always legislative change. Sometimes that action is more monitored. But it's rather than saying corruption is really bad in Kenya, we should do something. It's trying to find ways to map that corruption and try to figure out how to put positive pressure to try to change that situation. So when I look at that video, I feel like things are, are really changing. And I think this model that The Guardian is putting forward that they're calling open news, for me is very close to what we call civic media. So this is the center that I'm running right now. I generally tell people that civic media is the intersection between two things. It's the world of participatory media, which is to say it's the world where we get to create media. We don't have to just consume it, but we can create it. So all the folks here who are tweeting this, the folks who are taking notes and are going to post a blog post about it, anyone who takes a photo, whether you post it to Facebook or Flickr or Twitter, that's all participatory media, right? Participatory media, most of it, is not very politically or civically relevant, OK? If I go out and I take a photo of what I had for lunch today, even though it was a really nice lunch, that's not civic media. That's not of public interest. Uh, that's not going to benefit society in one fashion or another. But some small subset of that participatory media overlaps with the world of civics. It overlaps with what it means for us to be a democratic public. It overlaps with what it means for us to make decisions individually and collectively about how we want society to work, who we want to elect. And so that intersection between the two, what's relevant to our civic life, and what happens through participatory media. That's the space that The Guardian is talking about. That's the space that I want to explore. So I want to ask two questions. And I'm going to try to answer them. But then the good news is that this becomes a discussion. So if you disagree with my answers, you get a chance to argue with me. But I'm going to make my case first. And then I'm going to sit in the chair. And then we can work it out from there. Is this vision likely? And I'm going to say, aside from the pigs killing the wolf, which seems pretty unlikely to me, the rest of it actually sounds quite likely and actually like we're already there. One of the ways I think we actually know that we're there came on this turning point in 2005 in London. So London had this terrible bombing on July 7th. All over the city, tube stations shut down, death all over the place, a giant shocking event that really changed Londoners' view of the world, had an enormous impact. The way almost everyone found out about it early on was through these really blurry photos like this. And that's the photo of people walking through one of the subway tunnels, one of the underground tunnels that the trains run on, because the trains weren't running anymore. So these were people who got caught between two underground stations had to walk through this tunnel underground to get above to the surface. But everybody now has a mobile phone. Those mobile phones have a camera. It wasn't the person who snapped that said, I'm a citizen journalist. I'm going to report on this event. Probably what the person wanted to do was say you know, to, to their husband, perhaps, hey, I'm OK. We're walking between the stations. Here's what it looks like. Isn't this crazy? What's going on? But that becomes an act of eyewitnessing. It becomes an act of reporting. And from this day onward, you've seen major media outlets around the world say, 
if you see an event, we would really love you to share it with us. So you see CNN do something like I report, where they encourage people to go out and do it. If you follow BBC Africa, you see on many of those stories, are you in Harare? We would really like to know your opinion on this. And if you look closely, you mostly see it in places where the BBC doesn't have a very good footprint. So it's often when it's in a rural area, it's often in a city where they don't have a bureau, they know that they can't deploy a reporter to everywhere. And so sometimes they're looking for someone who had that real experience in the real time. Sometimes they're looking for someone who might be able to go out and get some questions or offer an opinion. But one way or another, we have already seen newsrooms change their mind and decide that this is absolutely part of their reporting. Now there's another part of this that I think is important to look at. I don't know to what extent this became a phenomenon in East Africa, but this was a very interesting and very strange campaign that happened in the US, where you suddenly had US teenagers who knew nothing about Africa getting very, very concerned about the Lord's Resistance Army, mostly because people had started figuring out how to use social media to promote a cause and a campaign. So this is another part of what happens. We're seeing people say, we demand you pay attention to this story. You may not think this story is important, media, but we're going to demand attention. Because at a certain point, the media has to say, wow, one million people, 100 million people have watched this video of this campaign against Joseph Kony in six days. That's more than watch any television show in the United States. It's actually nine times the audience of any television show in the United States. Obviously, this is something that we have to pay attention to. What's also interesting about this is that it becomes the opportunity for other people to raise their voices. So while you have this US NGO demanding action against the Lord's Resistance Army, you also have ordinary East Africans, in this case, Roosevelt Kagamire, who's a citizen journalist in Uganda, saying, actually, I want to have my voice in this discussion. I don't think the LRA is the major problem for Uganda right now. I think you're painting my country in a very bad light, and I'd really like you to pay attention to what I'm saying as a Ugandan on the ground. It's not too often you see a random Ugandan journalist get more than 600,000 views on a YouTube video. And she's not doing anything exciting. She's not singing or dancing. She's just talking about what life is like now in Uganda and why it's important to listen to the voices of people on the ground. So not only are people reporting stories, but people are proposing stories. They're advancing stories. They're shooting stories down. They're bending stories in their own direction. Whether we like it or not, this shift into a digital world where what gets to be news has a lot of influence coming out of social media, my sense is that it's coming. And my sense is at this point, there's sort of no way to resist it. I gave a talk a couple of years ago. I was in Budapest, and I was giving a talk to a Hungarian audience. And, and Hungarians can be very grumpy. Uh, they can be very negative. Their country's been invaded something like 17 times in the last 100 years. So they're quite negative. And, and, and I was standing in front of a banner, and I had to have one of my friends translated for me, and it said, the internet, by 2015, it will be completely unavoidable. And I think what I'm trying to say is that the internet is already completely unavoidable. Uh, it's already changed what we're doing. This vision, whether it shapes up exactly the way that we're thinking about, is coming into play. And many of us who work in newsrooms already understand how these dynamics are happening. This is, for me, what the media starts looking like in this digital age. We may see ourselves, for instance, as part of the mainstream press, if you write for something like Daily Nation. You might see yourself as part of an alternative press. You might see yourself as a blogger or someone who uses Twitter. But all these things have gotten intensely interrelated. It's possible that any of these media could be where a story originates, it's possible that any of these media is who ends up deciding to amplify that story to the point that we pay attention to it. It's possible that any of these media is where the discussion about the story takes place. So we don't just live in Nairobi 
anymore. We also live in this ecosystem. And when we think about our stories, we have to be thinking about where in this ecosystem our ideas are coming from. Because all of these voices are there, whether we're listening to them or not. It's all potentially part of that conversation. So this is where I wanted to raise the question, is this a good thing or a bad thing? And this is a question that I know a lot of people who've been working in journalism for a long time find themselves asking. So I'm here, I'm telling you, I think this is inevitable. I don't think you have a choice about this. But one choice is whether you're happy about it or angry about it. And so I want to try to first make the case for the angry side of it, and then I want to try to make the case for the happy side of it. Here are four points that come up again and again and again when people start trying to think about what are these changes, okay? Verification. If we end up in a world where anybody with a mobile phone can report, how do we know if anything is true? How do we know if people are just going out there, they're making up photos, they're staging things, they're giving false reports? How do we know if the person is just an, 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 an inveterate liar? How do we know whether any of this is believable? There may be problems with journalism, but at least we see ourselves as professionals. We see ourselves as doing a job. That job is to give the truth. Verification seems like this is going to be a massive problem. Second problem, sensationalism. If part of what's going on is that we are reacting to what our audience is telling us, and our audience tells us, we want more stories about the three little pigs. We want more boiling wolf stories. Are we just going to get the bloodiest, nastiest, sexiest, most celebrity-driven news we can possibly get? Are we going to lose the seriousness? And are we going to simply be driven by what an audience wants? We worry when we open up these spaces for people to discuss a story, or for people to put up topics that they care about, or for people to leave comments, whether we're leaving spaces for extremism. Are we making it possible for people whose views are not in the mainstream to have a voice that they wouldn't normally have? Is it possible that someone who believes that Somalia should sweep down and capture Kenya and make it part of greater Somaliland suddenly gets a voice in the media and is perceived as being taken seriously because they figure out how to be heard in this space. The last one, the one that I hear the most in the US, is this question of sustainability. All of us like to have jobs. All of us like to get paid. Near as we can tell, as fewer people read newspapers, people are less willing to pay for newspapers. And they're less willing to pay for ads in newspapers. In the US, at least, we have this very strange dynamic where an ad in a newspaper, in this old technology, costs about 100 times more than an ad in this new technology on the web. I don't pretend to understand why this is. They started at about one to one. I started running ads on web pages in 1994, and I sold them the same way that I sold them in a magazine. But now, the economics have changed. And so people worry, will we have the money to do verification? Will we have the money to provide context? Will we have the money to do investigative work? Can anyone make a living at this anymore? I'm not going to answer those one by one. What I'm going to say instead is that this really comes down to a sense of where you think we're going with this. This is a guy named Dan Gilmore. He's a very serious journalist, probably the best technology journalist in the US, wrote for a paper called the San Jose Mercury News. And he discovered 10 or so years ago that if he started listening to the people who read his column, he was a better journalist. He started referring to his readers as the people formerly known as the audience. And what he ended up saying was, look, I'm writing about technology for people in Silicon Valley in California. These people are really knowledgeable about technology. I might be smarter than each of them individually, but I'm not smarter than them as a group. And if you put 100 or 200 or 500 of them together, they have knowledge that I couldn't possibly have as one person. And so this really takes us to this question. Do we believe that a group of people can get smarter 
or do they always get dumber? And I mean this as a very serious question. This is a serious question for humanity in general, right? When we get people together in a mob, it's usually not a happy thing, right? It's usually a very bad thing that's happening. But it's possible that when we get people together in certain structures, we get greater wisdom. In some ways, that's the theory behind democracy, is that we could collectively make a better decision about who represents us than if we simply ask one person to do it. Somewhere in this question is a question of whether we can figure out ways to rethink and rewire journalism in a digital age so that we're getting smart mobs rather than dumb crowds. And I would say that this is a space that we have some control over. I don't think we have to simply wait for it to happen. I think we can make decisions to understand what's going on and make choices about how we build it. So I want to go back to the basics of reporting. So here's this tragic story that happened on Sunday. I think everyone is familiar with the, the bombings in Garissa. I saw that there was a wave of arrests about it today. I bring this up because I want to think about how an event like this gets reported by the people of the nation who are reporting this. And I'm going to suggest that there's something along these lines. And this may not be a familiar way of thinking about the newsroom, but bear with me for a moment and see if you end up agreeing with it. And if not, again, I'm going to sit down in a chair and you can tell me why I'm full of it. I think what happens is that events happen in the world. And events happen all the time. Events happen when no one's watching them. Most of those events aren't news. So in many ways, one of the first things that has to happen is someone has to say, I think that's news. I think we need to report on that. I think people need to know about that. Usually when a place gets bombed, it's probably news. It actually, occasionally in some places, may not be. It may not be news in Syria at the moment. That the, the level of violence is so high that that may not even rise to the level of an event. But one of the first things that happens is that prioritization. The next thing that happens is we try to find accounts of that event. It may have been that there was no one in Garissa uh, who, who was directly at the story. It's unlikely that someone was directly there at the church at that time. If so, they were probably in hospital. But what you're looking for is what happened. So that means finding eyewitnesses. That means finding people who experienced it. That means finding out other people who've asked questions to find out what's going on. What it really means is finding those people who were there and had the mobile phones, much like those people in London. This hasn't changed that much. We have always looked for eyewitnesses. It's the thing we always do in a news story. Now those eyewitnesses may have gone a step further. They may be documenting themselves, but we're still looking for them. We're then trying to figure out who's telling the story. What do we actually know? What can we verify? before we put it in print, what's true versus what's false. And this may be the hardest thing that we do in journalism, is to try to figure out how we take a piece of news and how we actually verify. I think we actually spend a lot of time on that. I don't think we spend enough time on this, which is that for that news to make any sense, we have to give some context. To understand that story in Garissa, particularly if I'm not a Kenyan, I need to understand the situation with Somalia. I need to understand the situation with the Kenyan military and involvement in Somalia. I need to understand a lot of dynamics between the countries, between the history, between the violent history of this past year to have context around it. And in fact, one of the hardest things we do as journalists is add that context to it. It's one of the critical things that we do. Because if we just give people facts, we're not really telling them stories. We're just giving them a little piece, but people really need to know why does this matter, how does this affect me, how does this connect to my life and what I have control over. And then finally, once we've done all of that, all that work, then we might share it. Now this model that I'm putting up is actually a really old model. And it's actually kind of a broken model these days, because that isn't what happens anymore. The first thing that happens is that someone sees the bombing, they take a photo, or they say, I just heard an explosion in Garissa. Something's going on, OK? No verification, no context, 
just someone's report, and that gets disseminated. That's out there. And we see that all the time. It's always out there. It's on Twitter. It's on Facebook. It's always going out there. One of the ways we can handle this is we can say, OK, that's all right. I'm cool. We'll just have that be one of our accounts of the event. So maybe we'll have a reporter go out to the scene. Maybe we'll interview some eyewitnesses. But maybe we'll use some Twitter accounts as well. Those are all inputs to our process. We can still verify. We can still contextualize. We can get there. But it gets worse. Because the truth is, we're now under pressure to put something up as soon as possible. So as soon as we have an account, we're pushed to get it out there. And we'll put it out there and we'll say, this is not yet verified. And when we have verification of it, we'll put it out there. And when someone's done a piece trying to set it in context, we'll put that out there. We're publishing all the time. So the citizen accounts, they're part of an input. And now we have multiple outputs. At every stage of our process, we're putting things out there. It gets worse. Now, dissemination turns into discussion. Because when we're putting it out there, people say, wow, did you see what's on the newspaper's website? They said that the bombing was committed by these people. What do you think? And in fact, the discussion ends up being an input. If no one talks about the story, we know that we haven't yet done enough of a job of making people understand why this would be important to us. Or we may be dealing with something where our audience is saying, I don't really care about that. One way or another, this is where we get a feedback loop into the system. We get discussion to tell us this is a high priority. People really want to talk about this. Or people are talking about this in a really dumb and ignorant fashion. We may have to put a lot more context on this. Or people are asking questions that we don't have an answer to. So we need to go out and get more accounts and do more verification and figure out what happened because that's what people want to know. So if that weren't awful enough, remember this whole space of citizen accounts and discussion is even uglier. And it ends up looking like this. You start looking at that god-awful, complicated <coughs> world of citizen media and you're digging into it at every moment that you're trying to do a story. And for me, this is what the newsroom looks like. You'll notice I didn't even put dissemination in. We keep spitting out information whenever we can. It might be more mature or less mature in the chain. And we're putting it out there, and almost immediately, it's turning into this conversation in all this other media. So what do you do when you look at a world like this? I think the main thing you do is you get back to the basics. We really want to know some very simple questions. We want to know what happened. We want to figure out if that report was reliable. We want to figure out if it's relevant to our lives. And if there's something we can do about it, we want to know about it. And I think with all of this confusion, if we get back to those very simple questions. Now, I'm not using words like objectivity or truth or balance or fairness. I'm talking about something very simple. I'm talking about verification. I'm talking about figuring out whether something's reliable. And then I'm talking about trying to put in enough context that it makes some sense in a larger arc of one fashion or another. I think there's actually a terrific example of this. And it's a local example. I suspect everyone in this room knows Ushahidi. I don't know if you know the early history of the project. So this is a project that started during the election violence, because the people who started putting this map together, notably Oria Cola, was very, very upset that there was simply too much going on in Kenya for any newspaper to report on. That even if it was as simple as one woman's shop in Eldoret being looted, that she had a right to have that story told and to be recognized. But there's no way that you could tell that whole story no matter how big a newspaper it was. So at a certain point, you had to open yourself up and say, how do we report that story together? And so the platform starts with literally as simple as, please send in an SMS message, give us a report of what <coughs> happened. And one of the things that the people behind Ushahidi figured out very quickly is they had the same problem. They had to verify. 
Because what happens is it becomes to your advantage. Hey, I had 20 shops looted in Eldoret. You had no idea that I was a major businessman in Eldoret, but I've lost almost everything, and I demand that the government get back to me. Well, you know, if that becomes my claim uh, you know, to the government, that's a real problem. If I end up saying that my neighbors have committed violence and then the police come to look at them, that's a real problem. But that's a problem that then started getting built into the system. You started looking at people who would make a whole bunch of reports. And if one person makes a whole bunch of reports, particularly in different cities, they're probably lying. Because it's very hard for that same person to be in all those same places at the same time. If someone is making multiple contradictory reports, that's probably a problem. If someone makes reports and then we go out and try to check them and verify them, they turn out not to be true, we know that this is someone that we might want to trust less. So you start with this exact problem. You start with this problem of how do you do crowdsourced reporting, and then you very quickly bump up to this very journalistic problem, which is how do we do verification on top of this. And the answer is we need a combination of journalistic practice. Sometimes we need to go out and look and see, and can we find a photo of the place that someone was talking about? And sometimes we need technology. The problem doesn't go away. The technology on this isn't magic. It forces us to go and do it in a different fashion. And we've gotten good enough at it that this crowdsourced platform is now turning into a way that people all over the world are trying to ask very hard questions about how we report on very difficult issues that require crowds to come together. We're starting to see projects like this one coming out of South Africa called Corruption Watch. And this is built on top of Ushahidi. And it's designed to let, person, let people talk about whether policemen ask you for a bribe, whether you had to pay a bribe when you wanted to get your papers. Again, this is a place where it's possible to report a story that's almost impossible to report otherwise. How widespread is corruption by traffic cops in Nairobi? We probably all have an opinion on it, but to actually give a story, we would need to add thousands of people. And we would need to get some documentation. We would need to check out at least some subset of them. But by putting this out there and making it possible for people to start doing this, we start building frameworks that make this possible. And I know that there's going to be a lot of discussion about systems like this and where we go with this. So what I want to say is that I'm a big believer that we could have smart mobs rather than numb crowds. But I'm also a big believer that you don't get it automatically. I think if you just put up a system and you say, I want you to report on police corruption, you're going to get terrible results. I think you have to be very careful about it. I think you have to think through the techniques of how you verify, how you contextualize, how you tell stories around it so that you actually get to the point where you're doing news rather than just sort of gathering information that might or might not be true. But I do believe that there are huge stories that we can't tackle any other way than going out and trying to figure out how to put a lot of people together, which leads me to my closing thoughts, you'll be grateful for this. You may not like the, the closing thoughts, but you'll probably be grateful that I'm closing, uh, which are thoughts for what you might want to think about as a journalist in this space. I think the most critical thing that any of us can do right now is to try to figure out how we become part of that big ecosystem. I think this is a moment where saying, I'm a journalist, I don't read blogs, I don't read Twitter, there's nothing serious there is career suicide. Uh, and it's not just that you won't get hired, it's just that you won't be very good. You know, I, I, I don't think it's just that you promote yourself by having a social media presence. I think you learn a lot of things that you wouldn't otherwise learn. This is Nick Kristof. Whether you know him, whether you like him, he's one of the most important journalists in the United States. He writes an enormous amount about Africa, He's often pretty insightful. He's occasionally badly wrong, but he's enormously influential. He uses Twitter amazingly well. He doesn't follow that many people. He only follows a, you know, a couple hundred people. But the people that he follows tends to be experts on Africa. 
what he's very good about doing is responding to people. So here, you know, he's amplifying someone who's made a comment about Northern Mali and the destruction of the buildings in Timbuktu. Here, he's talking directly to someone about bride prices and dowries. He spends an enormous amount of time on this, responding to people. And he's in touch with 1.2 million people on this. Now, you would think it would be impossible to have a conversation with 1.2 million people, but he actually does it pretty effectively without it being his full-time job. But he does it in a way where he's listening to his audience. He's taking in a fairly small number of inputs, but he's really participating in the conversation. And in many cases, he's getting this as a way of getting cues, getting clues. What do people want to learn more about? What should he look at that he's not yet looking at? This is an example of a very healthy place in an ecosystem. Now, you don't have to be Nick Kristof to do this. There are good journalists who do exactly this with 200, 300, 500 followers. But they're listening to their followers, and they're engaging in a conversation with them to get ideas, to get a sense of where to go. The second thing, your audience is two things for you. The first thing is that they're an input. They can give you new ideas, they can give you tips, they can give you perspectives, they can tell you a lot of things that you don't know. I don't care how smart you are. Once you're facing 10 or 20 people, collectively, they have the potential to be much smarter than you. And your job in some ways is to figure out how you ignore the dumb, because people are dumb a lot, and how you embrace the smart. Sitting there and saying, my readers are so stupid, I cannot believe they would say that thing to me, while it can be satisfying, is not very helpful. What's helpful is trying to glean the parts of that conversation where you're able to say, thank you, that's helpful, now I know you want to know more about that. Or that's helpful, now I know that that's controversial because you're picking a fight with me. But the other things your readers can do for you is that where your reach comes from, where your attention comes from, is changing. Think back to that slide I showed you with how the newspapers are, are ceasing in the US. They are getting less and less powerful every day. Digital media gets more and more powerful. Think about those 14-year-old girls in the United States who tweeted about Joseph Kony to the point where my government, fairly foolishly, I think, ended up deploying more troops to Uganda. There's incredible power from people being an amplifier. And if you're working closely with their audience, they help you find a bigger audience for your work. And that's something that almost every journalist wants, is for people to listen to them and pay attention. I think we all have to get used to working with different kinds of people. I think most of us have gotten used to working with an editor, have gotten used to working with a photographer. I'm now telling you you have to get used to working with computer geeks. And I'm sorry about that. As a computer geek, I know how hard that is. I know how challenging that can be. But there's ways of telling stories that most of us as journalists are not simply going to learn how to do. Here's a visualization on the New York Times. This is where tornadoes strike in the United States. Tornadoes are our most dangerous weather disaster. They can kill hundreds of people. They're very unpredictable. But they're also very clustered. And you can start looking at them and saying, gee, I really don't want to live in northern Mississippi. That seems like that would be a really poor idea. And you can watch over time how tornadoes are happening. You can look at 2011, which was a very bad year for tornadoes in the US. I'm not suggesting that anyone in this audience is going to start building these complicated interactive maps. What I am suggesting is that any decent newsroom is going to have one or more people who's building visualizations like this. Learning who that person is, learning how to work with them to tell stories around the data is one of the most important skills we can start acquiring. And for the people in the room who are techies rather than journalists, there are a lot of journalists who would like to talk to you about how you do build something like this. How do you get the data? How do you put it in a way that people understand? We just taught a semester long course at MIT. I thought it was a course for engineers. And I informally thought of it as journalism for engineering students. I ended up with half the class being professional reporters in the middle of their career because they wanted to hang out with the engineers. 
I think that's a very healthy attitude. And I think it's a healthy attitude because ultimately we have to try to figure out how to tell the most compelling stories. And we need to tell them using whatever tools are appropriate. Most of us are most comfortable with words. I'm watching everyone take notes. I'm watching everyone type. This is a room full of word people. You can see the people who are less word people. They're the ones taking the photos. They're the ones doing the video. I'm teasing you. <laughs> there are different ways to do different stories. Good reporters these days don't just write. They film. They shoot. They look for data. They look for ways to visualize. At the end of the day, we're always looking for a way to tell a compelling story that someone wants to listen to and put enough context around it that we understand how it affects us as citizens. That these days means using a much bigger toolkit than we used to. It means relying on a much bigger pool of people than it used to. It means taking our audience seriously in a way that some of us didn't always do. But ultimately, it's still what we're doing at the end of the day. And I thank you for letting me uh, give what may have been a longer talk that I'd really meant to give, but I hope it was helpful. I will now shut up, sit in a chair, drink some water, and if you have questions, I would love to have a conversation with you. Thank you.